There are more stars in our little galaxy than grains of sand on all the beaches of the Earth. We are an insignificant speck in this universe. In my opinion, this universe is way too big for us to expect to be the only intelligent life in it. Ever since I was a little girl, I've been fascinated by the wonders of space and I dreamed about working for NASA. I, like perhaps many of you, wondered if there was anyone else out there in that vast expanse. I wanted to be part of the effort to find out. That dream, coupled with years of hard work, has led me to lead programs for NASA, to search for life in the universe with the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute. Now, an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star outside of our solar system. For decades, scientists were skeptical that we would ever be able to find these exoplanets because the stars that they orbit are so much brighter than the planets themselves. Looking for the light of a planet next to a star is like looking for the light of a firefly next to a lighthouse. It's very, very difficult. Despite this, advances in technology and different techniques have allowed us to indeed confirm the existence of exoplanets. So how do we go about searching for life on them? Well, it is far easier to look for something if you know what to look for. For instance, if someone were to ask you to go look for a dog, you know you're looking for something with four paws, eyes, ears, and maybe a tail. But what if someone were to ask you to go look for a not dog? Where would you even start? The media portrays extraterrestrial life as little green men, beings with big heads, large eyes, and long, thin extremities. Should this be what we're looking for? Actually, we're not quite sure what to expect, but little green men are definitely not what we're looking for. We need to start small and look for signs of what we would expect to find if we were looking for life on Earth. So, is there one thing that all species on the Earth need to survive? Actually, yes. Everything needs liquid water. So we're starting the search for life in the universe with the search for liquid water on other planets. But there are billions of stars out there, and we now know that, on average, every star has at least one planet around it. So where do we begin our search? To figure this out, we need to know about the planets themselves, about the stars that they orbit, and what else is going on in the planetary systems. In order to fully understand these three things, we need to be able to understand many, many aspects of each of them. So even if you were the smartest person on the face of the Earth, with the highest IQ, you would never have enough time in your lifetime to learn everything you need to learn about one or two of these planets, let alone the 400 billion of them that we think are in our galaxy. So given this, we need three things to find life. First, we have to find the planets that the life might be on. Second, we need to determine if the planets are suitable for life. And third, we need to work together to make any of this possible in our lifetimes. So we need to start with finding the planets. We use several main techniques. The first technique is direct imaging, or taking a picture of the planet. This is very difficult, but scientists can use an instrument called a coronagraph that blocks the light of the star and lets us image big Jupiter-sized planets that are orbiting not super close to their star. Here, you see a real exoplanet system in action. This four-second video shows seven years of data with one of the world's largest optical telescopes. The next technique that we use 
is a radial velocity or Doppler shift technique. This technique detects the presence of a planet by looking for the gravitational effect that the planet has on the star. It's kind of like the wind. You can't see it, but you can see its effects on the leaves and the trees and feel it in your hair as you walk outside. In this case, the planet tugs on the star as it orbits. And we see the star move towards us and away from us by measuring the Doppler shift, or the change in wavelength, of the light that the star is emitting. So this technique lets us get valuable information for one star at a time. The third technique lets us monitor many stars at once. This technique, the transit technique, lets us detect the presence of a planet by measuring the brightnesses of stars over time. As the planet transits or passes in front of the star, it blocks some of the light of the star, and that star dims just a bit. NASA's Kepler mission observed the same 150,000 stars every 30 minutes for four years. Thanks to NASA's Kepler mission and a similar mission, CARO, from the European Space Agency, we now know of lots and lots of planets. Currently, to date, we know of almost 4,000 confirmed planets with another 5,000 candidates to be verified. The huge increase in the number of planets that we've found has completely changed the exoplanet game. It's excited not only the scientific community, but the public as well. Now we have a place to look for life outside of our solar system. So we know there are lots of planets, so we need to figure out if the planets that we're finding are suitable for life. So to start, we need to figure out what type of planet we're looking for. Is the planet rocky with a solid surface like the Earth? Or is it a big ball of gas like Jupiter? We can combine results from different detection techniques to determine the properties of the planet. So we can find the size of the planet from the transit technique and the mass of the planet from the radial velocity technique. We combine the size and the mass of the planet to get the density of the planet. If the density of the planet is similar to that of the Earth, then the planet is likely rocky with a solid surface. If the density of the planet is less than that of the Earth, then the planet is likely a big ball of gas. It's important to understand the difference because if we find a big ball of gas, there's no solid surface to walk on, let alone to have liquid water. We also need to figure out if the planet has the right temperature to support water in a liquid state. Some planets are too close to their stars, and any liquid water that they may have would boil away. Some planets are too far away from their stars, and any liquid water that they may have freezes solid. Lucky for us, some planets are the right distance away that their atmospheres can keep their surface temperatures suitable for water in a liquid state. We call this the habitable zone. Guess which zone the Earth is in? So we're focusing our searches for rocky planets in the habitable zones of their stars. We need to work together to make any of this possible. When scientists work separately, their conclusions can be uninformed and conflicting with others, leading to not much forward progress. This is where programs like NASA's Nexus Initiative come in. Nexus is the Nexus for Exoplanetary System Science. It's a NASA headquarters initiative to bring hundreds of scientists together to look at planetary habitability from different points of view. These scientists study our Earth, our Sun, the planets in our solar system, and the exoplanets themselves. We are mostly made up of observers using telescopes to find the planets, and theorists who are creating and using computer models to predict what we should see in planetary systems. We also have scientists that work in laboratories to see which molecules we should be able to detect. 
and other scientists that work on the statistics of measurements and the models. Everything that we think we currently know about exoplanets comes from measurements directly made in our solar system. So we need the planetary scientists to model the interiors and the atmospheres of the exoplanets. We need the solar physicists to model the effect that the star's radiation has on the planet. And we need the Earth scientists to model the surface conditions of the exoplanet. The knowledge gained from our solar system helps us interpret the little bits of exoplanet data that we're currently able to obtain. Nexus brings these scientists together. They bounce ideas off of each other, and they ask many questions from different points of view, with often surprising results. At our kickoff meeting four years ago, many scientists were shocked to find that not everybody had the same knowledge base. So we had to get everyone on the same page by talking, by sharing ideas, by sparking each other's curiosity, and by asking many, many questions. By working together, we've begun to make progress. We now know that in addition to liquid water, we can look for other biomarkers or signs of possible life. These biomarkers include molecules such as methane, which can be produced by many different processes, including cows, and also ozone and carbon dioxide. If we detect these molecules, these biosignatures on a planet, that increases the probability that that planet has life as we know it. We will soon have the technology to confidently detect these biosignatures. And once we do, once we find these signatures on a planet, that means we found life, right? Job done. Hmm, not quite. It turns out that there are also non-living things that produce these signals. For instance, volcanoes, also produce methane. So if we're not careful with the little bits of data that we're able to obtain, we might mistake erupting volcanoes for flatulent cows. The task of finding life in the universe is immense, beyond the capability of any one person. What would it mean to find intelligent life in the universe? There's a big leap between finding liquid water and biomarkers, and finding intelligent life. I mentioned at the beginning that I thought this universe is way too big for us to actually be the only intelligent life in it. If we're successful in finding intelligent life out there, it would answer humanity's age-old question of, are we alone? Personally, I think that we will find life someday out there. And depending on what we find, it could completely change the way that we think about life as we know it, along with our place in this huge universe. Thank you.